We still have our beautiful ranges out there doing um, burning back and looking after country. Um, and I think things are moving forward and our farmers are looking after country. So we're all in this together. Uh, I read recently that um, someone over at Kyogle, a farmer, donated so much land to be uh, regenerated and, you know, that he wasn't going to you know, use it for any cattle or whatever, farming, but give back and look after the land. So here we are today, I think hand in hand, looking after our beautiful country, and it's ours, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And whatever happens um, on the 14th of October, it belongs to all of us, whatever happens. And I think all of you here tonight um, are a tribute to that. So thank you for all the support, being here, all of our elders that have fought so hard and passed the baton over to us. All of your elders um, have, have fought hard and um, told different stories. Um, and some, sometimes the stories aren't so good, but um, you know, people change along the way. So one of the tough stories um, was Rabbit Proof Beds. True story, mm. which is great. It's a part of history. That's you know something that we need to keep. And this lady standing beside me, and I haven't known Chrissy for very long, so I was really <laughs> privileged to, to know her. Um, I saw Rabbit Proof Beds some 20 odd years ago. I met a dear friend um, in Sydney, didn't know her before that. She was watching Rabbit Proof Fence at home on Land Long. I walked in and uh, we both sat down to look at it. We both started crying. We both had a couple of wines. And we've been friends ever since this lady down in Sydney. So, um, talking about this lady here though, um, I think, Chrissy, what you've done in the story that's been written, the magic that you have put into the script and direct, it's so important. We can't, we can't lose that. You should be very proud of what you've done. And I know you're very modest about it and humbled about it, but really it's a piece of history that we need. And if you didn't take that on board, we would have a book that maybe not many people would take on board. They might read and put it aside, but this is a part of history that's going to be alive for the next generations and the next generations. It's a piece of history you should be very, very proud. I'm so privileged um, to meet you and um, to be able to introduce you tonight. So thank you so much for what you've done in sharing our history together. So I rang 
the University of Queensland Press, and they said, yes, the blood are only just available. And there's been a lot of interest. I mean, we're asking everyone to write in their version of how they see the film. Three pages, we're asking three or four pages. So I wrote and said, well, I never made a feature film before. I'm only not going to film my blood, but this is how I see it. And I got the rights. Um, wow. Yes, it was wow. And then got even more wow well because I started going to Gibbons with Dodds and staying there. The first time we went, I flew over to Perth. We caught the bus from Perth to Newman, which <laughs> takes forever. We st I think we stayed overnight at Nick Farrah in this hideous pub. <laughs> I went into the pub and there were topless girls behind the bar <laughs> serving. <laughs> and we stayed in a container at the back of the pub. Anyway, <laughs> we, <laughs> we got to Newman and we stayed the night. Newman's a mining town. And then we, the next day, some jiggle on the mop came and picked us up and took us about three hours directly east. And the road was um, asphalted for 20 kilometres. <laughs> it went out of New Mill, you're on this asphalted road, and then it just turned into a dirt track, more or less. And off we went to Jigalong, which is a very strong raw country, LAW. It's very strong raw, it's very traditional. And it was absolutely amazing. I very uh, I don't know, I, I, somehow I, I just went with the whole experience and very easily learned my place. There were four, I was not allowed to go anywhere on my own for, ve for very good reasons. Number one, I might go on men's country and that, then I would really have to be punished. Number two, I might get injured because there were snakes and things. Number three, I might get lost very, very easily. And the fourth one, which I discovered once I'd gone with Doris's son once to the river, was I might get to no good. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was the best gift for me because then I used to, we were staying with Molly and she slept on the veranda and I slept on my, in my um, swag on the other end of the veranda. And I, I would have, because I wasn't allowed to go anywhere on my own, I'd have to wait for the kids to come past to go swimming down at the creek. And then I could go with them and I'd go with them to the creek and lie in the water because it was so hot and listen to them talking. And I realised that that, what I had to do if I was going to write this film was I had to re-enter a child's world. As adults, we leave that world behind. We, we forget how they talk, we forget how they interact. And these kids, I could just learn more to listen to them. And then I'd be with them and they'd tell me things. They'd say, oh, you know, this is, we, this is the stuff that we put on our, you know. This is for painting. And I've learned so much from them, just little kids. And basically, the Jigalong lot, for them, I, I was the equivalent of a kid. I, because I knew nothing and I had to stay in. But it was exactly what I needed. Mm -hmm. um, it, I, so I wrote this script, not knowing how to write a script. And I showed it to a a friend of mine who actually was a scriptwriter, and she told me two things. She said, um, it's not a novel, it's a poem. You have to, and scripts have to, you have to read them really quickly. You can't write a novel, paragraphs, description. You have to find the word to describe what you're saying. And then the second thing she said to me was, you, don't know what your story is yet. <laughs> How could that be possible? I, the story was three little girls running, but 
right? And I thought, wow, this is, I don't know what my story is yet. And I thought, oh, okay, maybe it's a fairy story. The wicked witch steals the children away from their home and takes them to her house, the house of forgetting, which was what Moor River was, no language, no connection with their own country or their family. And then they run away and the wicked witch follows them, putting all sorts of things in their way, like Mr. Neville with the police and blah, blah. But man, this is a fairy story and it's really such a magic number. And I, so I kind of went along that track and the thing is when you're writing, you go on the track and then you come to a point where you go, well actually that's not right. But bits of that still remain in the script. It's quite interesting. And then I thought, oh, maybe this is um, a kind of war story where the country's been invaded and the invaders are starting to steal the children and the children have to run back through enemy-occupied territory, which actually works as well, <laughs> and be chased to try and get them back. Um, and then I sort of pursued that idea for a bit. And it, it took me almost until I'd almost finished the script to finally work out what this was about. And I finally realised this is about a mother and a daughter. This is about a daughter returning to her mother, coming back to her mother. This is about a mother-daughter relationship story. And that is so simple, but that's at the heart of it. And I think that's really why it's had the actually huge effect it has all around the world. It's been quite amazing. And it's because everyone has a mother. And it, but it took me forever <laughs> to discover that. <laughs> in, you know, in the writing deep, it's, I had to go, anyway, that was, um, I mean, when we were, I'll tell you one story about when we were filming. We were filming the taking scene. And the first sign was when Nikki the mother gives that cry to the kids when she sees the policeman. So we shot that scene and then we ended for the day. And because it was getting towards the end of the afternoon. And that should have kind of warned us about what was coming. Because the next day we did the policeman in the car and that. Um, we had a two mob, different mobs. We had Ningali's mob, because Ningali's mother, so nice, Ningali's mother, who plays Molly's mother, her mother, the grandmother, is played by her mother. Oh. It's so nice. And all of that mob came down. <laughs> and they were, there were a whole heap of women, they were all in the scene you know, where the Molly comes back and there's the painting up. They were all there. And then we had a mob from um, at um, Alice Springs, who are actually almost professional Aboriginal <laughs> parts and come and do all sorts, and they're really great. They were all there. Um, so everyone was there for that scene of the taking, and when that happened, every single, everyone crept up out of where they crept up to surround that scene being filmed. It was so moving, it was so terrible. And I realised that I had it in my head what taking was. Not we all know intellectually what it was. But the reality, the reality was suddenly to be confronted with that. The, um, the man who wrangled the camels wept in a ditch. Everyone was in tears. We, we could not do anything after that. That was 
where you could not, every single person on that film set was completely broken by that. Mm -hmm. And the Aboriginal people had all experienced it, all of them. It was just amazing. So, but I have to say, after that, <laughs> that for me personally, for me, this was always a triumph and story. Yeah. Molly gets home and Daisy gets home. They live in Jigalong. Daisy becomes a very, very important woman in that community. And for me, that was a, it, it, it was a triumphant story. They make the way. We, we go on about whoever it is at Burke and Mills or whatever. I'm like, oh, God, it's just three little girls. <laughs> <laughs> and you have no idea how hard it is. One day, one day when I was with Dorothy, it stopped at Yalgo. There's a um, bit of the rabbit proof fence still there, Yalgo. And we were visiting. I don't know, some relatives. In fact, we went there and there's a kangaroo hanging by to there go. <laughs> on the veranda. Anyway, he was looking up, it's now an emu proof fence. And we went out on the rabbit proof fence and had a, a barbecue, and there were about two cars of us. And after lunch, people went off for a walk and wandered off. Well, there's a fence there, there's clearance on both sides. Like, Probably almost as wide, if you put a fence down the middle, it would be clearing on either side of the fence. Two people got lost that afternoon. Two of the people got lost because it is, that is so tricky. You, you very easily get lost. You move off this and you are in danger of getting lost. They finally found a way back, but I thought it really gave me real indication of how skillful those girls were. Yeah. Really unbelievable that they made their way back and got back. Anyway, enjoy the film. <laughs>